So I would say that banks have been very prudent to manage their balance sheets uh, in a way that they have over the past couple of quarters. Frankly, the loan loss provisioning uh, has been quite high, uh, in some cases uh, very high. And I think that's a good thing in overall because hopefully sooner we get the economy back to fully functioning and people back to work and kids back to school whenever we can do that safely, uh, sooner we're going to see a recovery that is then going to allow those banks to deal with those loan loss provisions appropriately. So I'm encouraged that they have been conservative on the side of provisioning, uh, perhaps even more so in some cases than necessary. But I think it's going to pan out to work out quite well in the long run. How much does how it pans out uh, rely on the government stimulus program being extended? Well, some of it certainly will depend because uh, some of the small businesses in particular have been hit hard by the inability of people to walk in and, and uh, provide patronage in those, in those shops and businesses. So they are relying on government help uh, for the time being. Some of it will depend on how quickly can we just go back to whatever the new normal may look like, masks, no masks, whatever, whatever that happens uh, when we get to the point of uh, being able to, to safely return uh, to our offices and a functioning society. Some of the hardest hit financials in the market have been the community banks. And, and while and it sounds like you're, you're saying they're, they're in decent shape in terms of their own financials, I think the question is, what kind of shape are their customers in? Small businesses and you know, all sorts of businesses, and spe especially in the services sector around this country, and whether we have yet to see the actual damage because the stimulus has helped sort of keep things afloat in the last few months. What would you say on that? So I would say that stimulus has certainly worked to the point of bridging that initial shock to the economy for a number of businesses. Small banks in particular have seen, and we have heard anecdotally from our banks, that customers have been able to rely on the government payments to get them through the first few months of uh, economic closures throughout the nation. I would say that in the long run, um, you know, all of these things have costs associated with them and how long the government is able to provide that subsidy to the economy and to the individuals and businesses is going to be decided, of course, by our elected representatives in Congress. But from the perspective of the small banks and community banks in particular that serve in rural communities, in communities that have been hard hit by the last crisis and have not really fully recovered, those funding sources have been a life source uh, and a lifeblood for those, for those communities. So I would say that uh, if we can um, have a little bit more help, that would be good for the economy from the government. But at some point, it's going to be imperative that we get people back to work. Uh, we've seen digital adoption soar across many industries, but uh, including in the banking space. Is that a big threat to the smaller community banks whose spending on tech has massively lagged for, for obvious reasons because of their size? Uh, what the big banks and fintech companies have, have spent on tech in the last couple of years? That's a great question. And frankly, it's a question that's going to decide the future of community banks in the United States. Uh, in a speech last year in St. Louis, I basically said if the, if the small banks in particular do not adopt new delivery channels that their customers have come to expect from technology companies, they're going to go the way of, of uh, I said, then Blockbuster. Uh, but the, the truth of the matter is that a lot of these small banks have been very agile in their adoption of the technology. The costs in some cases are prohibitively high. So we have done a number of things that the FDIC through our FDI Tech Initiative to make sure that we understand what those costs and obstacles are for small banks. Because frankly, the, the survivability of community banks in the United States is going to be depend on, depend, dependent on whether they can adapt, they can adapt quickly, and whether or not they can match as much as possible the delivery channels and the services that their bigger brethren has. Uh, and the FDIC stands ready to help them in that transition. So we're looking at a number of our initiatives uh, internally and externally uh, by the agency to make sure that we can provide a path to digital adoption by the banks. But if there was ever silver lining in any crisis, I would say in this one, it has been that we didn't think we could get, even from the agency perspective, to, to full on-site examination as quickly as we did. Mm -hmm. And we certainly didn't know how would small banks react to it. And so far, everything has gone very seamlessly. Uh, on the topic of tech, uh, Chairman <laughs> Williams, as I glance at my uh, stock screen, the, the big winner uh, in the financials tab that I look at has been PayPal this year. It's, it's up 90% uh, or so. Is it starting to get to the space where some fintech companies, uh, particularly the most successful and bigger ones, have, a, have an unfair advantage over the banks because they're not regulated to the same 
degree. Uh, are there any companies out there that you'd like to see fall under your regulatory, pur regulatory purview because they essentially are now banks, even if they're just online only? Well, you know, you should never ask a regulator if they want more power and more, <laughs> more, more entities to regulate. Uh, the answer is always yes, right? Uh, so long as I'm in, in this chair. But uh, here's the bottom line. Uh, these companies, frankly, um, are able to provide the delivery channels that banks, um, in many cases, because of the way they're regulated, are unable to do so. And I think there is a fine line here. Instead of, of it being one versus the other, I think we can have a cohesive system where there is a level of codependency uh, that would allow banks to team up with technology uh, companies and provide technological solutions that frankly would be very expensive, in some cases prohibitively expensive for banks to develop. Uh, and from a regulatory perspective, it's fair to say that we need to get our knowledge base up so that we can adequately supervise these, um, I would say, coexisting relationships uh, and our ability to understand how technology companies are doing these types of services and whether or not they're appropriate for the banks to adopt. So I don't think it has to be a you win, I lose type of environment. I think it can be a symbiotic relationship through which the the end beneficiary is the consumer because of the more competition in the system will drive down the, the cost of the products and services and increase the availability of the same.